Welcome to this discussion panel on driving financial inclusion uh, using digital tools. As we all know, there's been a trend in the industry towards increasing online and digital engagement with clients and in different parts of the finance industry itself. This has happened at different speeds and in different forms, ranging from moving online to digital engagement through engagement through apps, as well as automation and the use of AI. It's been the journey of the last few years and even more recently accelerated due to COVID. While it does feel like a relentless push forward and has many welcome and positive developments for the industry, uh, there are many people who are being left behind through this process and it can be a danger if we don't consider all of the issues that could be relevant. I have with me today a fantastic panel of people to talk to and share their own experiences of using digital tools to drive inclusion in different aspects and parts of the finance industry. Um, before I introduce them, I do want to say to all of you, uh, what you will see on the side of the uh, panel discussion is a comment section. As we go through the panel uh, interviews, there will be a chance at the end for me to pick out all of the questions that you've raised and put them and place them against the panel members themselves. So please feel free to use that as we go through. So um, before we start, let me, um, let, sorry, let, as we start, let me first introduce my first panelist, Mick. Mick McAteer, the CEO of the Financial Inclusion Centre, who has a history of involvement in financial inclusion, as well as the regulator, uh, partly by being on the uh, consumer panel of the FCA. I wonder if you could um, share a little bit, Mick, from your own perspective, a little bit of the policy and regulatory environment um, and some of the insights that you gain from how digital inclusion and digital tools have been used to drive further inclusion in this market. Yeah, thanks Faisal. It's, uh, and let me start, start by saying thanks for the opportunity to, to speak at a conference where we're great uh, supporters of mutual mutuals at the Financial Inclusion Centre. I, I cut my teeth uh, at Wits Magazine trying to defend mutual, de you know, stop the demutualization of building societies in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, at the Financial Inclusion Centre, we've supported a lot of credit unions around the country and we work with credit unions all over the country as well. Now, I just want to say a few, a few words about what the, the challenges are uh, relating to the greater use of technology and big data in financial services, and particularly when it comes to financial inclusion and financial resilience. Now, if I can just quickly quickly set the scene, you know, to, to just to try and explain why this is so important. You know, at the, at the center where we argue that we've, we've really just reached the end of the beginning of the COVID economic crisis. I know a lot of people think the economy's recovered now and everything's getting back to normal, but this really is just the end of the beginning of the first phase of the COVID, uh, the COVID economic crisis. There's a long, long way to go before we can actually be, 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 be assured really that, you know, that the, the, the economy and household finances have been rebuilt. And I would say as well that it, what is quite worrying is that a lot of households that we work with came into the, the COVID economic crisis with the low levels of financial resilience actually, and who were very, very financially vulnerable. And I'll go as far as saying that the, you know, uh, from, the, from the, the 2008 financial crisis, we've actually made almost no progress at all in building financial resilience and financial security amongst the households that we actually work with. So I say it's a really, really big challenge now post COVID, you know, and I hope we can learn the lessons from the, the, the post uh, 2008 financial crisis. But what does technology and um, data mean for the financial inclusion challenge? Look, you know, it is because it is almost, it is pervasive now. It is used by almost every, every financial institution, big and small, whether it's a primary provider or an intermediary or an advice firm or whatever. Technology and data is now at the heart of how businesses are actually run. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Look, you know, we take the view really that there, there's clearly going to be some benefits, you know, arising from the greater use of technology and data. We think some consumers will actually get better personalized products. You know, we're encouraged with some of the, some of the interesting financial capability apps that are coming onto the market to help people ma manage their money better. And I think a, a really overlooked benefit of technology is in the sort of the more boring back office part of um, financial services. Technology, if done well, can actually really improve the administration, the processing and collection of information, customer relationships. And if we can build greater efficiency into the financial sector as a result of digitalization and data, then that will lead to greater and greater inclusion because the industry can serve more consumers. 
But as I say, look, you know, we have made almost no progress when it comes to financial inclusion and resilience in this country. And if we use technology and data wrong, then I'm afraid that what's going to happen is that we're going to see financial exclusion amplified. And I don't just mean exclusion, I mean outright discrimination as well, because if you think about it, you know, financial financial services work on the basis of profiling customers. You know, the industry is expert at profiling customers according to, you know, they know how to identify customers that are they consider to be high risk and low profitability. And they can identify customers that are low risk and considered to be sort of high profitability as well. So they know which customers they want. Now, the thing about fintech and big data is that as we said in our paper, Ralph, fintech beware of geeks bearing gifts. Fintech and big data allows financial services companies to profile customers on an even more precise level. So it is now even easier for financial services firms to identify those customers they want. It's easier for them to identify those customers who want to exploit their behavioral biases, and it's easier for them to identify with even more precision those customers they want to go after. So unless we're very, very careful, then I'm afraid what fintech and big data will do is simply amplify financial exclusion and financial discrimination rather than support financial inclusion and financial resilience. I mean, as well as the outright discrimination and exclusion aspects that we're concerned about, a big theme of our work at the moment is how, is how fintech and big data and general digitalization, you know, the big tech platforms, they're actually, they, they, have be, they, they have become embedded in financial services. They now play a crucial role in the creation of demand for financial services products. They facilitate access to financial services products. And what they are very, very skilled at doing is identifying and manipulating behavioral biases that consumers already have. So again, as well as amplifying exclusion, there's a real risk of actually the use of fintech and big data and digitalization can amplify the problems we've seen with the manipulation of consumers' behavioral biases. And then the last, bit of, the last thing I would mention really about why, why we're concerned about digitalization and big data is the competition angle. Now, what we've seen in the past really was that the payday lenders with their deep pockets, you know, you know, you know well-behaved mutuals you know, well-behaved credit unions and building societies really didn't stand a chance against the ruthless payday lenders who use technology to its utmost to exploit consumer behavioral biases. They basically sat down and they identified what were the barriers that were stopping people borrowing money, you know, and they systematically removed those barriers using technology. Our concern at the centre really is that we're going to see the repeat of that now with the sort of the growth and the establishment of digitalization and big data. And we are concerned really that unless mutuals are given the right support, then you know they're going to come off second best again against the more ruthless firms in the financial sector who will exploit digital digitalization and big data for 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 negative for negative ends rather than use it for positive means. So that's Pfizer really all I wanted to say by way of introduction. You know, this is a poorly regulated sector. You know, you know, the digital and data services industry is poorly regulated compared to retail financial services, you know, credit unions, building societies and others have to comply with strict conduct of business rules. The big digital platforms, the big tech platforms, the information and data brokers do not have to comply with anywhere near the same degree of conduct of business standards when it comes to treating customers fairly that financial services, including the smallest building societies and credit unions have to. So again, you know, Let's watch a space, you know, so far we see greater risks and than greater benefits as a result of digital digitalization and big data. So I really hope we can all work together to make sure that technology and data is used for good rather than used to exploit consumers. Thanks. Thanks, Mick. Uh, I think you make a really strong point there. It, it's often considered that big data and information will, will simply be a straight path for increasing conclusion inclusion. The more information we have about a customer, the more we can give them access to services. I think you make the really valid point, though, that it's not just about the access to information and the data itself. It's also about these biases and how biases can be used to influence that behavior. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to say more about that, because I think that's come under quite a lot of criticism recently around how biases may be driving a different type of behavior, having included people. Well, again, it's really, really interesting. I mean, I wish I wish we could probably devote a whole session to this, Faisal, you know, about behavioural biases and um, and financial services. But look, I mean, you know, one of the reasons why why we had 
so many problems in the past. We know with you know was it people were under saving, under insuring, but they were over consuming debt. Now what we're seeing again now is the rise of things like buy now, pay later products. You know, these guys have become so clever that actually inserting themselves into the buying process. So what they use is they you know they use the sort of the bait of actually a, you know a new bit of fashion, a new consumer good, a new product, a new pair of shoes or whatever. And they've been able to cleverly insert themselves into that process so that the demand is created by the by the product that the, that the consumer wants to buy. And that then allows them to insert their debt products into the sales process just at the right time that facilitates the ability of the consumer to buy a product then. You know. So again, it comes back to this point that they, they are incredibly good at identifying and manipulating consumer behavioral biases. And that is not always used for, for good purposes. You know, quite often, you know, the, the, ultimate, you know, the ultimate purpose of technology for the likes of the buy now, pay later companies is to get people to take on more debt. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest with this. That is, the, that is the purpose of it. The more debt pe people take on, the more money these people, these people make. That's what they're in business for. You know, they're commercial organizations. They are not nonprofits. They're not charities. They are in the business of selling debt products because the more debt products they sell, the more revenue they generate. So the whole purpose of using behavioral insights for these guys is to get people to take on more debt to generate more revenue. That's the market for you, you know. But as I say, the really, really important thing is that the the market will use technology for for its own purposes, and those purposes will not always lead to better outcomes for consumers. Mm. No, thank you. I think the, the thing that comes out really strong there is around purpose and use. Uh, technology, as we all know, is, is a tool uh, and it can drive lots of different types of outcomes uh, and uh, resolutions for people. And so maybe I want to sh switch now to, to talk to, to introduce Emma. Emma Knowledge, who is the Deputy CEO of Wave Community Bank, uh, formerly East Sussex Credit Union. And, and Emma, you, you've had the experience of using technology in, a, in, a, in your own way, using technology to drive inclusion specifically at the credit union itself, at the community bank. You've used it in probably what's been a very difficult year for all financial institutions as they've either had to close branches or, or make a rapid shift online. I wonder if maybe you could share a bit about your experiences of, of what you've done and, and, and how you've done it. Because I think the, the third part of that is, I'm also really interested in how you've ensured that nobody has been left behind. Sure, thanks Faisal. Um, yeah, we there is quite often a perception that credit unions are behind the times with their digital um, revolution, which is exactly what it is in credit unions. When I first started for East Sussex, uh, we were pushing a lot of paper around five years ago. Um, we had already started our roadmap to digital um, improvements and it actually happened to coincide with the pandemic and it was really good that we got to the point that we had because we were rolling out a lot of new systems as the world was shut down. So we were very fortunate in that we and we had planned to be in a position to be able to continue to help our members digitally. Um, but. There, there is a pressure on, as Mick said, there is a pressure on the smaller mutuals and the building societies to be able to provide digital platforms in, in the Amazon world where it's, if you like this, you'll like this. This is what people expect now. And we don't have the IT budget to match that. So it's how do we provide the kind of service that's going to attract people to us um, within the budget that we can manage. And as a not-for-profit, our pockets aren't deep. So trying to balance all of that, there is a lot of collaborative working amongst credit unions with our IT suppliers, our fintech companies, to provide the right kind of services for our members in a way that we can facilitate financially, because we're not going to do any of our members any good if we go under. Which um, So we've got to make sure we're doing everything in the right way at the right time um, and we fortunately could switch seamlessly as COVID hit to um, vast majority of our loan applications were online anyway. We then went to all of it online. Um, but we did before, because we kind of saw it coming from January, we knew, we knew this was coming um, in January 20. We did sit down and look at our list of most vulnerable members 
the ones that came into us wanting checks to cash at the co-op bank, the ones that wanted really quite a personal service still from us because they couldn't manage to work within the digital world. It's not their world. So we have fortunately uh, spent many years building partnerships in um, particularly in Brighton and Hove and Eastbourne where we have charities and other agencies that we work with. So we got to the point where I think we had less than 10 members they were like, okay, these people really need hand holding by somebody else who's still going to be functioning relatively normally during the pandemic. And how can we make that work between us? But we went through our membership and we worked out who really needed the support during the pandemic and how we could make that work because some of them simply digital wasn't their platform. Um, and we've noticed that uh, certainly since Universal Credit was rolled out, that's all online. You have to have a bank account that you can put in online. And a lot of people simply don't have the footprint, the digital footprint. They don't have the right ID. They're not on the electoral roll. They don't have, you know, the fixed abode that's required. All the things that are required to be in the benefit system that could help people become less vulnerable, more resilient. They, that was barriers all the way. So we've actually worked very hard to help people become part of the system, part of the banking system by getting accounts with us. If they didn't have the right ID, we found ways of getting um, referrals and things like that. So that from support workers, from the DWP to prove these people are who they are so we can help them. So I think the answer is yes, technology is there and it will help 95% of people but particularly in the credit union world, we have a lot of people that still come to us that just simply aren't in that big data world. They don't have a footprint and we have to help them to get into the system in order to survive. It's it's um, one of the strongest elements of the credit union is the fact that they're just, they are rooted in their local communities and in some ways they have yeah. these networks that allow them. I'm wondering if, like, what, what's your what's your advice to other organisations in other parts of the country that don't have that historical precedent that a credit union has around building those kind of networks and bringing people along, and particularly for yourselves, you know, having had that network established, what were some of the challenges for you to to make it work? Because, you know, the overlap between uh, financial services organisations and support can often be quite difficult for people to to get their heads around. Yeah, I think. Um... Building the networks isn't actually that difficult. People want, you know, when when you have uh, the councils and support workers and charities and agencies that are trying to help people, they want to hear from you. They want to know what you can do. They want to know how you can facilitate their needs. So approaching those kinds of agencies is actually brilliant. I've had a support worker nearly in tears saying, you've just given me a complete solution to a problem. So, and that was very simple because I said, can I come and talk to you and tell you how we can help your homeless um, people that were staying with them? It, it was a homeless shelter in Brighton. I can help you get these people into bank accounts. And they're like, this is amazing. So it was literally a case of saying to them, I can help you because uh, they want to hear it. They want to know how this can get better. So I think one of the most difficult things is change, political change, jobs change structures change in councils particularly and you've got to stay on top of that who's moved into what job who do i talk to now about that what's what's the new policy about um having centralized uh database for homeless people so that you can help them in all sorts of different ways are we on that database are people able to find us so it's a case of constantly having your finger on the political pulse the, what the work the charities are doing, which charities have not got funding this year, you know, who, who's taken over doing that work if they're not doing it anymore. Those kinds of things. You've, you've got to know what's going on in your local community, particularly so that you can help the most vulnerable people with in financial services as we do. I mean, it's really interesting to hear how one of the most important aspects then becomes not simply just how do you have a much more efficient, easy to connect way of engaging with your members and customers the online networks or the, the the platforms that you've created but actually the way that you talk about how as an as an organization you need to be outward looking so looking for the organizations that you could be helping looking for who you could be engaging with in yeah. order to provide a solution and i think that bit of it is often forgotten about when you think about 
um, this this transition, this transformation that organisations are taking. Um, just just one last question on that. I just I guess I'm curious to say, ask you, how would you say that for the people who've been able to make that journey, that jump, and the ones that you've been able to support, how have the tools that you've created helped? How have that? How has that made it easier for them or, or easier for you? Um, it's made it easier for us because we can facilitate more people that are in a vulnerable position purely you know having having our own digital systems at a level that allows us to work more efficiently is fantastic um i think with with certain the very vulnerable people that you deal with who even having a bank card is too much for them you know then you have to kind of say okay well we we need to find another route for you and we we may work with a partner who can help them in a different way um so there, I think you also have to admit that sometimes digital just isn't the answer and some people just simply won't find their way in the digital world. <laughs> Otherwise, there are solutions and, they, and it, I think being a community organisation that's small, we do get to know a lot of our members and particularly the ones that need our time and our energy and our care. We can then persuade them very gently, you know, go, going and cashing a check isn't maybe the best thing for you now you know maybe you should try using a card make you know give it a go see if you and we can have that benefit of the relationship the face-to-face -face contact and possibly because we're a not-for-profit and we have the relationships within um east sussex and brighton and hove that if their support workers saying go and talk to the credit union they'll help you we we get that nudge forward with this person then someone's saying you know th these guys are good they'll help you out so then they might actually try something which for a very long time they've had absolutely no interest in no thank you no that's really good to hear thank you for that um i'm going to introduce my third panelist who's going to give us a slightly different perspective uh, in a slightly different area so sean millie who is the founder of bright blue hair and i guess has would be described as a self-confessed insurance nerd uh, focused on digital and financial inclusion which i don't think does justice to the range and scope of her experience which covers everything from corporate banking to fintech firms and um, i'd like to ask her to talk a little bit around um, inclusion digital inclusion in another aspect of the financial world in this case specifically around insurance um, she has a long history a, a long a long a deep understanding of this market so i wonder if perhaps this part of the world that isn't really talked about in terms of inclusion, you could share a bit of your insights, Sean. Uh, tell us what you're seeing, tell us the interesting innovations that, you might, that you've come across and maybe some of the challenges that you see in that sector. Thanks so much, Faisal. And um, I just have to say, I'm just so totally inspired, Emma, by what you're doing and the, the real world impact that you're having on people's lives. It's really, really amazing. And Mick always makes me feel like I've got 20 more years um, to do to, to make any kind of contribution at all in a good way, Mick. So yeah, so insurance then. So one of the things you asked me to think about, Faisal, was, well, what are we seeing in terms of using digital tools that are impacting um, financial inclusion or not? And so I, this is not going to be a happy story, although there are some positives in there that I'll bring in at the end of some, um, some chinks of light, let's put it like that. So what's happening in insurance? Actually, uh, I think the really important thing to take on board is that insurance has not been a laggard in, adop in adopting AI and big data. It's quite often used as an example, particularly by uh, the, the trade press that wants to talk about startups disrupting the whole world the whole time, because that's how they make their money. Insurance is quite often described as a sort of lumbering beast. Now, don't get me wrong, in many ways it is, but not in the adoption of AI and big tech. So we've been doing this for a very long time, um, actually. Um, the original data sector, um, you could call us. What is happening at the moment are some really serious and complicated and quite heart-searching debates, although not at a, a huge level. This is more about professionals talking to professionals around personalization and hyper-personalization. So the kind of targeting that both Mick and Emma and you, Visor, have been talking about, but applied in the insurance space where that kind of really zoning in on the markets that you want or the individuals that you want, those labels around personalization, hyper-personalization can only happen with the application of big data sets, loads and loads of credit data and AI and machine learning 
built in to the warp and weft of how underwriting happens, for example, how the pricing um, and packaging of risk actually happens. So what are those debates? Well, you know, on the one hand, and it's really interesting to listen to the language because risk is also insurance is actually obviously, well, it's obviously to me, has its roots in risk pooling. It, it was the original mutual in many ways, right? So today, today's professionals and investors and all the sort of ecosystem of people that are living off startups, scale-ups and incumbent businesses, real debate. If we follow hyper-personalization to its logical conclusion, are we talking about insurance anymore? Because by definition, hyper-personalization is not risk pooling. So you'll hear people having conversations about uh, risk pooling, yes, or is it cross-subsidy? Are we subsidizing others at the expense of people who are you know, notionally a better risk because they fit our targets better? So some really live debates, but not at a, a level where you'd necessarily hear about them. It's more about individual professionals talking with me. And, you know, many times um, in all areas, actually, regulatory and compliance and in underwriting, having some real misgivings about where they feel the journey is, is sort of inexorably pushing them, particularly in life and health, where actually it would be true to say that there's a that the take up the use of AI and big data is perceived to be lagging. And as always, what happens is that there's a massive industry now. There's a load of sales by FOMO and catch up before you're overtaken. All of that kind of language that we're really used to um, urging life and health companies to catch up with various types of disruptors that are held up as, as the face of the future. Um, so I think that that sort of where is digital where are digital tools being used extensively impact on financial inclusion or exclusion? Well, the sad thing is for me as a as a critical friend and massive supporter of the social necessity of insurance, is that we are now the number one target for informed advocates like Fair by Design. Um, and, you know, people working with them, like the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, producing a report basically saying that insurance has now evolved to be, um, just let me get this right, has evolved to be the biggest contributor to the property premium in the UK. In other words, the, the, un, the, the additional cost that you face to buy essential services if you happen to be born or live in poverty in the UK. So we're, we're the number one problem for people like Fair by Design. Um, and you know that's 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 not a happy place to be in in my view particularly as i said as a sector that's actually arguably at the forefront of using big data ai and digital tools and and i think what's really part of where i'm trying to sort of have play my tiny part and and a lot of that is about connecting um activists and connecting <laughs> professionals and having those conversations together, because that's one of the, the barriers that gets in the way. There's no big conversation about insurance's contribution to financial inclusion or exclusion. There's lots of great work going on in voluntary groupings. And, and as always, I always have to say, you know, I never denigrate the individual issues of a huge, vast majority of insurance professionals working every day, purposeful, technically brilliant, um, professionals across all functions who really do want to do the best for their customers and particularly at the point of a claim so you know obviously if you have home insurance or any kind of insurance the point is that if something happens to you that you are then able to to reach out and, and get money and support to get back to where you were before that um, event um, entered your life at claims, my, my personal experience is that claims professionals are really engines of empathy and desirous of customer trust and using all the digital tools at their disposal to try and make that journey and that outcome as good as it possibly could be. So whilst I'm criticizing my sector as a whole for not in my mind taking a leadership role and not being muscular enough about asking ourselves the really important questions about are we using digital technology just to create a segment of best risk or are we actually contributing to what Khalifa talked about in the report as the financial resilience of every citizen in the UK? Where are we in that? Um, nonetheless, you know, there are on a day to day basis, you will find very purposeful uh, claims professionals using every tool at their disposal to make a difference. 
So let me just give you a couple of examples then, Faisal, of when I was racking my brains. And that was the other thing that I found slightly depressing. Faisal said, think about some positive stories, Sean. And I'm thinking, mm, they're not exactly springing to the front of my mind, but here's a few. <laughs> So I was um, vested interest. I was personally involved in at a very small level with Lloyd's Banking Group's um, an innovation program that they ran um, specifically for insurance. And it was specifically targeted at working with um, startups. So tech enabled startups, um, a couple of fintechs, some other other types of techs uh, to develop propositions and services that could be taken into the bank, into the warp and weft of, of how the bank operates. And uh, there was a de definite ESG focus there and that S part, the social part, um, through that process, um, I got to meet um, Invest AI and their indefatigable founder, Manu Pelletario. And that business is all about using AI to help people claim the benefits that they're entitled to. But because the system is very complicated, all the kinds of stuff that Emma um, has talked about in terms of process and so forth. Um, in best AI is there to to support other institutions to make sure that their customers get what they're entitled to. That's a really good news story mm. that the bank went out of its way to support. Um, I could give another example around um, inclusion. So financial inclusion is also about having work that pays well, right? Having a good working experience where you can actually live and do everything that we all want to do as humans, have that self-expression, but also that economic independence. So one of the things that's really inspired me about an incumbent insurer called Kavea, who are primarily based in Halifax, is they're using all their human skills and loads of technical skills over a period of years to embed themselves in that community, in and around Halifax, to make sure that employment opportunities are not just restricted to the same old, same old. They're actually going out and consciously setting targets, creating energy, measuring themselves against their ability to create meaningful careers and inclusion within insurance um, and economic benefit um, to, um, for the people living and working in, the, in their area. And, and that's a practical thing that is making a difference to people's lives. And it's putting money in people's wage packets in their bank accounts, hopefully, um, that there would not have been there had they not gone out and consciously made that part of what they were, part of how they do things, rather than just a, a flash in the pan project that lasted a month or two. So I could, uh, there's another example, Faisal, if I've got a little bit more time at this point. So I've, like, I've recently... Like I might hold you for the second. I might, okay. might hold you for a second because I think there's a huge amount of insight that you just shared with us. And I think we might come back to it and I want to hold a bit of time for, for reflection, but just, just a couple of points that I wanted to just draw out. One, um, I think you've really expanded how we think about um, digital itself, right? So it's not just about data, actually. It's not just about information. It's not just about online. It actually goes to the heart of um, what our institutions are about. I mean, you posed the question for uh, insurance providers, which are mutuals, or, which have been mutuals, which, which are mutuals, uh, and mutualized risk, that what is their business if they become hyper-personalized? I think these kind of questions get down to the core of what I think uh, many of us are grappling with, which is ultimately purpose. What is the purpose of our institutions and, and how do we use it? And so in some ways, a little bit about what everyone has, has talked about so far is that the, the tools are one thing and actually we need to understand that the tools are much, much broader than we think. But if we think of them simply as tools, then we miss the, we miss the point that much of digital exclusion is about us as organisations and what our organisations are there for. And so that raises lots of other questions, which are, you know, um, how much of our business or our industry is being driven by a, these things before we thought about our purpose in terms of doing these activities, whether that's inclusion or, or otherwise. And, you know, Mick, you gave some great examples about the kind of the buy now, pay later market and also the payday market where regulation caught up late into industries very much driven by technology. Emma, you gave us a great insight around how um, the outside network of the branches are more important sometimes than the inside networks in the branch in terms of getting there. And Charles, obviously, you gave us some fantastic insights around how that gets to the core of the mission of the institutions that have been set up. So I think what I'm getting out of all of this is that the, the, the concept of digital inclusion isn't just about the customer. It, it, it's about everything. It's about everything. It's about the ecosystem. It's about the environment and the organization that you're in. And so it begs the question, which is, the world is now moving extremely rapidly in this direction, much quicker than before. 
um, people who perhaps wouldn't have taken the jump to working remotely or digitally or using their, using their phone to do their banking in the past or, or having an online banking, that it almost feels like because of COVID that, that jump has been taken. And, and we have some examples. I know I've challenged you, Sean, to come up with some good examples and you gave us some great ones. I, I suppose I want to hold a bit of space and just say it feels like innovation is really the the the, um, the the call of the day right now and right now a lot of that innovation is is pushing down on a different set of purposes and some of those purposes may not be in the interest of what we would say as positive and inclusive so in that last in this last bit i'd like to open this around to asking you all individually you know how can we use innovation to help us drive access reduce costs and provide better services and and where should that innovation be i'm going to i'm going to pose that big question to all of you uh, and, and maybe in the order that we started with i can just give you a couple of minutes to to, to, to tell me what you think how, how can we use innovation to to focus on access cost and service and where should that innovation be taking place uh, mick why don't you kick us off with something here yeah, well, uh, thanks, Faisal, for landing me with the huge question first. You know, it's uh, that's quite a big one. Um, I mean, look, I mean, we, we always we always try to make the point that the at the inclusion centre that there's a you know whenever we hear the phrase financial innovation, it's really really important to to distinguish between you know economically and socially useful innovation and the rest of it. You know, and that's a really really important point because if you look at the history of I mean, I'm old enough now to have been through a lot of cycles and things, you know, and it's um, of so-called innovation. And a lot of the innovation we've seen in financial services has simply been, you know, new products or, you know, variations on a theme, you know, similar products, slightly tweaked, you know, or whatever, or or even worse, you know, pro, you know, innovations and in quotes like payday lending and so on, which, which people got really excited about it. They thought it was, this was competition, this was choice, this was new entrants coming into the market to, to disrupt the market and so on. That's not innovation. You know, that was just the use of technology to actually extract value from, from, from consumers, you know. So I make a real difference here between the word, the general term innovation and innovation that is economically and socially useful. Innovation that actually improves people's lives or improves mm. their financial well-being. Now, the question is, how do you, how do you encourage or promote economically and social socially useful innovation that is a really really difficult question because for everything that i said previously all the sort of the weight of the money all the weight of the technology the weight of the data as sham was saying you know i mean all that all that skill all that technology all that resource is actually being deployed to allow firms you know the primary providers like insurance companies banks consumer credit companies debt companies and so on it's all been used to try and help them extract value, extract more value from the customer relationship. Yet the people who are, who are, who, are, who, can, who can use technology and innovation to generate economically and socially useful innovation, like mutuals and so on, they just don't have the resources, you know. So, yeah, I completely agree with you that purpose is really important, you know, but a purpose alone will not actually generate sufficient economic and so economically and socially useful innovation because. Mm as well as purpose you need the capacity and the resource you need the technology and the tools and you have to bring those together in a way that allows you to sort of to out compete the big guys in the market and history tells us actually you know they know that, that doesn't look too promising at the moment you know it's the big guys with the big money with all the all the all the big institutional capital behind them they're actually in a position to use technology and big data to extract more value and extract more revenue from the customer relationship and it's the good guys you know with the right purpose simply don't have the capacity yeah. or the resource to actually take them on but as i say look you know it isn't all of a council of despair you know there's a lot of great stuff that can be done i think around the processes and administration and customer relationship some of the stuff that emma was talking about is really really inspiring but it's not about trying to change the world it's about making the relationships better you know actually helping socially purpose organizations do their job better that can make a difference to people's lives make a real difference to people's lives much more difference than a sort of a fancy algorithm or artificial intelligence can do so i would i would really urge urge the sector really to focus really on try, trying to use technology to actually help their organizations deliver their purpose better but it's going to take better regulation it's going to take a lot of resources additional resources to allow you the social purpose sector to actually try and take on the big guys, particularly when it comes to innovation. 
No, thank you. Thank you, Mick. That's a, that's a good point. And I guess that, that, that leads straight to you, Emma. It's uh, You talked about stretched budgets. How can you drive, I guess, the innovation in in in, in, in your industry to, to step up to this challenge? What is it that you need to, to try and provide the alternative? Well, I think what you actually need is some heroes. Um, I have a, a lovely story to go with chance. Uh, we work with a fintech called Quo Money, who've created an app uh, that is it's a, a unique a money management behavioural app. So it will say to you, uh, if you keep spending like this in six weeks time, you're going to be overdrawn. You know, it, it tells you when you're going to have a disaster coming. It tries to help you behave, change your behaviours so you improve your position. The ultimate goal with it is that with credit unions, people that will be a decline for a loan because they can't afford it will change their behaviour so they can then access credit from us. This is the ultimate goal. The guy that set up Quo Money, Matt um, Vernon, he has done this as a social mission piece of work for himself. He wanted to work with credit unions. Where I've been involved with him pretty much from when he started doing it. Uh, I just answered an email. He said, you know, what do you think on this? And I was like, yeah, let's have a chat about it. See how it goes. Three years later, we've got the app. We can give it to our members for free. Um, and it's those kind of social mission heroes that we do have in the digital world that genuinely do do what Mick was saying, have the social purpose behind the technology and really genuinely help people to improve their position. And and it, there are ways that that can happen in partnership. Credit unions, I couldn't, we couldn't, in our budget, we couldn't have had an app like Quo Money. I needed someone like them to come to me and say, look what we can do. And I said, yes, great, I'll have it, thanks. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. No, that's fantastic. And I think it's so true. It's the, um, it is, it is about the heroes and it is about engagement. And I guess my, my last question, that I bring the question to you, Sean, how can we get these heroes, these innovations? How can we, how can we scale them? How can we build those kind of connections to make the stories that Emma's sharing n not be unique? So um, there's a somewhat trite answer, and God, I just wish we had time to talk about all the stuff that Mick and Emma have just talked about as well, Faisal. I think we need a session dedicated to what needs to change and how. Just putting in a bid there, uh, FinTech Talents uh, colleagues. Um, so the, the, trite, the, the trite answer is, do you know what? We've got to make purpose-driven FinTech sexy. And I think that's already starting. So I, I'm quite hopeful that we have this sort of context of ESG and social license and yeah, some of the stuff, the rules are being rewritten around us by planet Earth, apart from anything else. So although we can't relax about that, I think the, the environment is much more fertile now than it ever has been in the 30 plus years that I've been obsessing about financial services in one way or another. But fundamentally, practically, what do we need? Mix right. We need social policy, not just financial regulation. Government's got to get to grips with the fact that the market is not going to fix this. I, I am learning this through bitter experience, talking to um, very purposeful people um, connected with the FinTech delivery panel project that I'm, I'm working with, um, you know, explaining, you know, that, that, that the market will somehow find a competitive edge in dealing with um, in producing stuff specifically for customers um, who who fit in who do not fit into the standard bucket and therefore do not support a VC backed growth aggressive growth business model. Uh, so we need a different approach from government. I agree with Mick. I think we also need um, strategic support for purpose driven businesses coming from government. So I want credit unions and mutuals to be supported uh, with partnerships, with technology, with people, with resources, with secondments. You know the practical stuff that Mick was talking about. Um, I think uh, there should be an FCA sandbox for, for at the minimum for purpose driven fintechs as well and insure techs and paytechs and whoever else can help with this agenda. And I also think that in the way that the FCA already is starting to rethink how it supports early stage and scaling for profit businesses, what I would like to see there is more support and transparency from the FCA to those businesses about what indicators they are going to be looking at to indicate that these firms really are embedding proper conduct, including appropriately structuring themselves to um, encompass vulnerable customers 
from the get-go. I, I don't think there's enough transparency and enough support and quite frankly, enough challenge. I don't think there is a level playing field there. And I think there's a lot more to be said about how do we level the playing field from a regulatory and compliance perspective, as Mick was talking about earlier. We can't have massive segments of the financial services world and reality for individual humans exempt from conduct regulation and from other forms of um, appropriate supervision. It's madness. Let's fix it. How's that? Is that, a, is that a good enough to-do list, Faisal? Brilliant. I think, fortunately, the to-do list I can pass to the organisers for this, at least for some parts of it. But I think the bigger to-do list is to uh, all of us and to the audience as well. I mean, it's 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 a great it's a great presentation. So much good content from all three of you, and I I completely agree. We could we could dive deep dive deep into all these issues, but I think to kind of having the unenviable task of time trying to summarise, we've got huge amounts of work where it's clear to all of us that there is something and a role for the regulator to think a bit more proactively about how we ensure inclusion occurs in the changing financial environment. We have great examples across the country, real heroes of doing success, but often those aren't highlighted or backed or supported at the level they need. And that we see that this issue is spread across all parts of the financial services industry. And there isn't a, set, there isn't a part of it that is impacted. And the core that comes to me, which I think for all of us in the audience and for the people who've been listening, is that the, the questions about digital inclusion have often been about numbers, but but really what we're really discovering, they're actually about purpose. And that has got to be a really uh, a, a core value that we all take forward in terms of trying to think about what are appropriate solutions. We're gonna stop there because we've run out of time, but hopefully we can now get an opportunity to go through the questions that you uh, sent through to the panel. Uh, I just leave it right now to say thank you to my panellists for making their presentations uh, and we will uh, try and have a go at answering your questions now.